just need to sleep in a little bit. I have a day I have nothing to do. This is about how I like to be here. So I'm glad that I'm very pretty in my mind. But that's also the speech that I feel that I have. Good morning. Man, of all the places you could be, Trinity United Methodist Church in Blythewood is where you are this morning. It's good to see you here in person and those online. We're glad that you're worshiping with us. God has been faithful from the beginning of time. He is continuing to be faithful in our lives and the lives of people around us because we stand on a rock-solid foundation that is under us. Regardless of what is happening around in your own life, just know that God is faithful. And we know this. Uh, by many ways. Uh, in this church, last Sunday, we had our summer splash. We had between three and 400 folks from our community and the church on our campus. We had a lot of fun going down to water slides, eating food, playing games, dancing. There was music. We had a good time. It was great that some of you could be there. It's great that we can open up our church uh, to have folks within our community. It's too many times we think about ourselves and we forget there's other people in the world. And there are other people in Blythewood besides us. And so however we can be open to that. We opened our doors on Monday to our blood drive and our youth building. Um, it was great, well attended. There were many gifts of life given as you may have given or received. And many will receive this gift. So thank you for anybody who has given blood and may consider uh, in the future. Uh, a couple of things to remember. Uh, Carson and I keep talking about this on the way series, I'm going to tell you, it is the pivotal series for my two years here. This is going to tell us where we're going. I'm going to give you the keys to the vision of where Trinity's headed. It's going to be very clear of where we're going. And we're going to have the sermon series. We're going to be in our small groups. We're going to talk about these things. Uh, and it's very easy because the parables in Luke that we're going to preach on will teach us. So though Carson and I are preaching, Jesus is the one who's teaching us how we're going to do these things. And so when we do these things, you'll find and we'll find that the community around us is just like, wow, this sounds like it's pretty new, right? It's not going to be a lot of big and flash and lights and smoke and mirrors. It's going to be the gospel, right, plain, and simple. Uh, also coming up in October is um, Trunk and Treat. It's never too early to plan for that, October 30th. 
October 30th, 5 to 6.30. We'll open up our parking lot again. You can decorate your cars. You can do whatever, but we're going to have a great time of celebration, and I think that that will be a nice way to kind of work our way into the fall. And Karsten and I are already planning Advent. Like, we're already getting ready to turn the corner to look towards Easter soon. That's how quick things are going, right? Um, but Advent's around the corner, so be prepared. Um, I think we've got a book for us. I think it's going to be cool, but we'll get to that point in the future. Um, Pastor Carson is going to be preaching on a text today that we've all heard of, and he's going to help us kind of understand a little bit about what it might mean. But one of the questions that's actually in your bulletin under the Reflect and Act is how might God use you to be part of someone else's healing and liberation, right? We look at how we ourselves are going to be healed, but we rarely look at how someone else, right? What am I going to take to make myself, and I'm going to get all of this and not worry about, right? Or we don't think about, or these other folks are outside of what we even see or know. But what are, how might God use us to be part of someone else's healing and freedom? And freedom, that Carson's going to talk about today, a little bit different in our minds, I think, than what we might be thinking at this moment. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to gather together in your house. To, as your people, we come to hear with open hearts and open minds. Let our hands be open and our feet move so that we might serve and, and, and be, be faithful to you, that you are faithful to us, whether we're faithful or not. That the foundation we stand on is rock solid, that you will guide us and that you will keep us from falling. You will be there to undergird us. And when we want to look inward, you help us so that with arms wide open, we might receive you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> cup of coffee today. Let's try that again. Good morning, Trinity. Good morning. Yes. All right. Whether you're here in person, online, or catching us sometime later in the week, we're so glad that you took the time to spend time with us today. 
As we begin our service, you are invited to stand for the responsive greeting, which is found on the back of your bulletin. We will read this responsively, and your part is in bold. When we are bowed by sin, our Lord forgives us. When we are held captive, our Lord sets us free. When we are weak, our Lord gives us the strength to stand. The time has come to give back to God our thanks and praise. One way we give back to God through thanks and praise is by singing of hymns. And our gathering hymn is number 384, found in your hymnal or on the screen, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Prayer for illumination this morning is also found on the back of your bulletin or on the screen. Let us um, say this prayer together. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's Psalter is Psalm 72, verses 1 through 6, which is found on the inside top right of your bulletin, and I believe also on the screen. This again will be um, read responsively, and your part is in bold. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock 
and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and the cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned for my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. May God bless the reading, hearing, and living of his holy word. There we go. Come on down. Look at these lovely ladies. Good morning. Okay. Who has seen an ambulance? You ever seen an ambulance? We heard a siren right before church started. I think that was a fire truck. So 
what's going on with, with the ambulance? They're, they're taking somebody sick to the hospital, right? So they can get treated. Well, how would it be if they, whoops, would you hand me that, please? If they got to the hospital and they said, yeah, well, you know, you're not supposed to be here on this day. You're only supposed to come Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. How do you think that would be? Not so good, not so good. I mean, they would, they would continue to be hurting or sick or maybe bleeding. Well, in, in the scripture today, there was a lady that was at church, and she was in the synagogue, and she had been sick for a really, really long time. And Jesus healed her, and she said, Woohoo! I feel so much better. Just like when people get out of the hospital, they're like, Woohoo! And somebody else was over here poo pooing, going, Yeah, well, you know, you're not supposed to do that on Sunday in church. Well, I'm just going to tell you, Jesus wasn't having none of that. So he set them straight. And, you know, there's a whole lot we can remember about this. But the important thing is that we need to remember is there is never a wrong time to do something good. And when something good happens, we need to be happy and say woohoo and hallelujah and praise God because there is plenty of bad going on in the world. So when we see the good and we are the good and do the good, we need to be excited about that. There's a, um, oh Lord, I hope my phone works, a saying that um, is posted in many churches, and this is often attributed to John Wesley. I don't know if he said it or not, but this is what it says. It says, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Now that's a whole lot that really says do good whenever you have the opportunity. All right, let's pray. And, and all God's children may repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you that you do not have set hours for doing good. We can do good all the time. And whenever we do good and see good, we need to praise you. Amen. We're going to sit here for just another second because what happened this week? What started this week? Nothing. Y'all don't know what happened this week. Didn't you start school? Yes, yes, you did. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Not you, not yet, but she'll be there soon. But I want to pray over you all that started school and you who are waiting to start school and all of our teachers and administrators and parents that are sitting in car rider lines for an hour. That was me this week. Um, well, I'm going to say a prayer for us, okay? So you don't have to say this one after me because it's long, but just listen and pray these words for all of our kids and, and adults that are starting school this year says, the year has tilted toward the start of school again. But truth be told, we're not ready. We're still hanging on to summer, to the promise it held, for long-awaited connections and celebrations, for a refreshment for our bodies and our souls, in water and sky and color and sunlight, and in those little moments given to us where we could just linger a little longer. Now that it's almost over, we don't want to let it go. The beauty, the freedom, all that was life-giving. God, could you help us stretch it, extend it, and maybe even blend it into our starting school year? Parents, students, teachers, all. May your newly structured days breathe with creativity, 
your new duties be infused with delight. As you write on those fresh new calendars, may you trust that your plans are a lot like magic ink. Much may seem to disappear into obscurity, but ever, but whatever is done in love will remain. Amen. Ready? Let's go to Children's Church. morning. Thank you for that prayer, Bonnie. Um, Cameron started daycare last week and Charlie moved on up to the two-year-old class. So it is truly a time of new beginnings, of them getting uncomfortably large and big. Who told them they could get that big? Um, I'm happy to announce that John Wesley did, in fact, say the quote. So excellent attribution. Um, and also that the sermon this morning will not be about Hosea and the people rejoiced. Um, <laughs> we're all done for now with all that talk of whoredom with the uncomfortable implication that we're not as faithful as we'd like to think we are with the unfortunate baby names please do not name your children no mercy God's steadfast love and forgiveness though we take those with us into this week we'll bring that with us from the book of Hosea hold on to that forever we'll put our faith that God's faithfulness will forever outpace our faithlessness. We're back into our summons. Ugh. We're back into our summer sermon sequence. Summer sermon sequence today um, through the Gospel of Luke, learning how to be disciples of Jesus, how to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. In today's gospel, we're presented with two different responses to Jesus doing the sort of thing that Jesus came to do. How will we respond this morning? Pray with me. God of healing and reconciliation, you free us from our burdens and promise us safety and refuge. Help us to trust in your power, that we may praise you without qualification and rejoice in the power of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're in Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus was teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher of the law, an interpreter of the Jewish scriptures. And this is not the first time in Luke that Jesus has been found in the synagogue. Back in chapter 4, Jesus gave his inaugural sermon on Isaiah at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. That day he stirred up trouble by teaching that God's grace was not just for insiders, but for outsiders too. For all the people we'd rather leave out. This day, he's still stirring up trouble, but doing it differently. He's busy teaching when a woman appears, seemingly out of nowhere. Her posture is her problem. As far as Luke is concerned, it's not just that she is unwilling to stand up straight with her shoulders back, not just that gravity is working against her, nor that she just couldn't seem to find a good chiropractor in first century Palestine. It's amazing how hard it is to find chiropractors back then. Her bowed spine is evidence of demonic activity. Luke says she has a crippling spirit, which has afflicted her for 18 years. Jesus will describe healing her as freeing her 
from her bondage to Satan. Now, this is not normally the way we interpret problems as 21st century middle-class Americans. We've grown increasingly creative in handing all facets of life over to medical professionals. It's not that kids are rowdy and don't like sitting still that they'd rather be playing video games at home than going to school. No, they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and we have a drug for that. Or and it's not that you're melancholic or unmotivated, it's that you have clinical depression, and we have a drug for that too. Or it's not even that your back pain is just a sign of your age, it's spinal degeneration, and we have a surgery for that. If you can dream it, there is a doctor out there who has been spending their entire adult life preparing to deal with just your problem. We've grown comfortable with, bear with me, methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism. It's the idea that science, and by extension medicine, can proceed as if all there is is just stuff, matter and energy. That we need not worry about ideas like souls, like God, like spine-bowing demons when we're trying to explain what's going on in our world. But spiritual activity was the frame for understanding the world in first century Palestine. In Acts, Jesus' ministry is described, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Everywhere Jesus goes, people come to him suffering from evil spirits, looking for him to do something about it. For Jesus to come bringing the kingdom of God, he must overthrow the powers that reign over human affairs. The overwhelming testimony of the New Testament is that Jesus came to defeat the rule of spiritual forces opposed to God. The overwhelming testimony is that while Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection proves that they will not reign forever, our world still feels the effects of these malevolent entities, sin, death, Satan, demons. It runs through scripture. The serpent in Genesis deceives Adam and Eve into the sin which brings about death. In Romans, Paul talks about death coming into the world through sin about our sin bearing the fruit of death. And then Paul will describe God's final victory in 1 Corinthians 15 as when Christ has destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death, so that God may be all in all. Whether we perceive every breakdown in our bodies as being caused by Satan and the demons or not, Christians have generally understood that death and all of its quotidian precursors, the receding hairline, the, the legs that just don't move the way they used to, we've understood all of death and decay, disease, as the indirect result of demonic activity. So today we might not identify each particular case of spinal abnormality or mental illness as demonic possession, but on some level, within our theology, these broad strokes remain. That Jesus is opposed to the power of Satan and sin and death, which torment us. And someday, they will be destroyed. When this woman appears before Jesus, she doesn't even have to ask him to do something about her condition. He calls her to himself, announces that she is set free. He places his hands on her, and he heals her. No longer is she contorted. She can stand erect. She's given a new perspective on the world. No more is she forced to keep her eyes down, away from the faces of others, staring only at their toes. She's back in human company, looking at faces once again, making eye contact. And what's more, she's restored to full participation in a society from which she had been estranged, shunned, on account of this attribution of her deformity to a form of demonic possession. She had been curved in upon herself, her spine bowed, unable to stand up straight. Now 
She is curved in no more. And she begins to praise God. Curved in upon herself. Curved in upon the self. In Latin, incurvatus in se. For the late 4th and early 5th century bishop, the cornerstone of Western theology, St. Augustine, and then particularly then for the reformer, Martin Luther, this image of being curved in upon oneself was the preferred metaphor for understanding what sin does to the human soul. God intends for us to be open to relationship with God and one another, to be open wide. And yet sin is a spiritual deformity, which keeps us from looking out in love, which turns us in upon the self, which makes us think that we're what's most important, which says, me, 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 me. And when the soul is curved in upon itself like this, the soul is trapped, trapped by its own neuroticisms, preferences, wants. Others exist only to fulfill needs. Jean-Paul Sartre may have claimed that hell is other people, but when C.S. Lewis paints a picture of the afterlife in The Great Divorce, his idea of hell is just being increasingly separated from other people, from any possibility of loving encounter. Hell, for Lewis, is being an island unto yourself. To be curved in on yourself is to be unable to love rightly, to love yourself in the place of God instead of receiving yourself and your neighbors as a gift to be enjoyed instead of finding in God the object towards which all desires are oriented. The self curved in on itself cannot see beyond itself to love God or neighbor. Self becomes its own God, tries to be the end of its own desiring, and of course, it can never be satisfied. Only by God's grace is that curvature broken. Only by God's grace are we formed into what God intends us to be. When God comes to us, we are made able to open back out to love God and neighbor, to love ourselves as we should. To stand up straight in grace, to walk in the light, receptive of God's gifts, and then to give well in return. Our focus turns from our navel out to our neighbor, to love of God and neighbor. We can even learn to love ourselves well. When the self is no longer made out to be a God, it can be a gift. Everything by God's grace in its right place. This woman suffering from a spirit of infirmity could do nothing to stand back up. It was a power beyond her holding her down holding her gaze on the ground. She was not set free by her own determination to get right. She didn't just go to a physical therapist. Jesus came to her and spoke healing over her, put his hands on her. Likewise, our sin-curved hearts have no power within them to get straightened out. Sin deforms us such that we don't even want to be right, got no interest in being healed. From Romans again, chapter 5. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely, therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God came to us, took our flesh and dwelt among us while we preferred darkness to God's light. God comes to us when we are too deformed by sin to look up and see that God is there. As we walk with Jesus, we are formed evermore into the image of Christ, made more able to look out in love. Because there is no more open posture than Christ 
on the cross. No one's arms could be stretched wider than in Jesus' embrace of all creation on the cross. The opposite of incurvatus in se, of being curved in on yourself, is the love of God poured out, is Jesus Christ crucified. All we have to do, having been saved by grace, is to go forth praising God. Praise is the natural response to freedom. Praise is the natural response to freedom. What's the first thing the Israelites do after God has freed them from slavery in the Exodus? After they get across the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his armies are drowned behind them? Do they go running off into the Promised Land? No, they stop there on the shores of the Red Sea because it's time for a song. Moses' sister Miriam bursts into song. The natural response to freedom is praise. Out of that praise, out of that newfound freedom, comes the desire to share it for others to experience that freedom too. Those whom God has freed, God uses to free others. The novelist Toni Morrison said, the function of freedom is to free somebody else. The function of freedom is to free somebody else. This passage in the Gospel of Luke sets before us a stark contrast between the woman healed and the religious leader dismayed that it happened on the Sabbath. Do we react to the healing and freedom which accompanies the kingdom of God coming here as in heaven by praising God, by participating in the work of the kingdom? Or do we react as the religious leader did, by appealing to the rules, offended at the disrespect to technicality? Are we too preoccupied with things that God does happening right by the book? So much so that we deny what God is up to in our world. Do we deny the gifts and graces that God gives to God's people? Certain that God wouldn't use those people that way. Do we find ourselves offended that things are no longer the way they used to be? That God's freedom comes to turn everything upside down? Jesus did not ask permission to set this woman free. And he certainly didn't then go and ask for forgiveness. In the parables which follow the story, parables upon which Scott will be preaching in a month as part of our On the Way sermon series, the kingdom of God is compared to yeast, to a mustard seed. Grace working in darkness, in hiddenness, in unexpected ways with unexpected consequences. Yeast takes a lump of dough and with some heat turns it into a loaf of bread. A mustard seed is so small, and yet grows into a big bush in which birds can roost. Grace is surprising, freeing, transforming. The kingdom is coming. Jesus is loose. He's been freed from the bonds of death. And in his church, in our world, Jesus is loosening the bonds which bind all of us when he comes across. So are you going to try to talk him out of it on procedural grounds? Or will you praise God and then delight in being part of someone else's liberation too? Amen. Let us pray to our healing and liberating God, saying, God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you invite us to honor, to revere your name through acts of praise and thanksgiving. Hear us, Lord, as we articulate the concerns of our lives, our community, and the world. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your holy church. Make us humble in our service and generation with our generous with our invitations to the outcast. God of mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for the needs of the world. Spur leaders to forego the honor and privileges of power and to address the concerns of the poor. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in our community who are burdened by suffering, the sick, those in need, and all who seek a deeper knowledge of you. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the departed. We rejoice that they have returned to the place of their consecration and rejoice in the company of the saints. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and compassion, you honor those in our world who do not seek tribute or respect. Help us to expand our vision that we might release our need for privilege and instead seek the honor of your service. We ask this through the mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Those whom Christ has set free in faith are free to declare their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you stand and join with me in affirming our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of the ways in which we show our thanks and praise to our God is singing, is lifting our voices in song, and offering ourselves in service to one another. Another way is to offer back to God financially, to give generously out of that which God has given to us, to thank God in blessing others through our tithes and offerings that he might use them for our freedom, for others' freedom. Let us give.
Almighty God, we offer back to you our gifts of thanks and praise. We offer these um, offerings and tithes as a way to show our thanks and praise. Lord, we pray that you use them to bring about that day when all shall hail the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is Lord of the Dance, number 261. Let us offer our praise to our God. the Sabbath, as those who have been freed by the grace of God, freed to love God, to love one another, and to love ourselves, let us go forth dancing in praise of our God. Go and dance. Amen. Amen.